Hi, everyone. So hi, I'm Chris. Uh, and I, I've been doing JavaScript for quite a while now. Uh, and uh, yes, back in the day, my tiny claim to fame was prototype.js. Um, so I want to talk to you today mostly about Babel and about how we sometimes like, use it as a slate hammer. And the time has come to use it in a more surgical way. And oh, yeah, I have stupidly two-dimensional scrolling, so I can't use that properly. Uh, so just a reminder about ES2015 or ES6 and the fact that we are late 2016 right now, so it's time to wake up. Uh, the native support is actually so much better than what most people realize. Uh, Edge 14, hi Nolan, uh, is at 93%, Firefox 53 and above 96. Chrome has been at 97 since 53. Safari, well, there's like a pre-10 and post-10 thing in the Safari world. Okay, pre-Safari 10, it was IE6, basically. Uh, since Safari 10, including uh, iOS 10, uh, it's 100%, so it's huge. And Node, uh, the current LTS, the 6 branch, since 6.8 has been 99%. And usually 90% is more than enough, because those remaining middle percent you have are stuff like proper iterator closing, or stuff like that, which most of us don't really care about on a daily basis. Uh, just a quick show of hands. God, there's many of you. I love it. Um, how many of you do JS mostly on the front end in browsers? OK, go down. And how many of you do it mostly in Node? Uh, how many of you are full stack? Oh, that's not nearly enough, people. <laughs> Got to wake up. Node is fun. Um, OK, so in real life, there's one thing, and you'll hear about that today, or very, very, very soon, actually, is that the native ES2015 modules are still a work in progress, both on the front end, because we are not going to put like a gazillion script type equal module tags in our pages, not just now, and definitely on the back end, because Node has its own module system, and there's like an ongoing lots of goodwill conversation going on between the Node.js Foundation and the TC39 to make those work together and relax both specifications so that they become compatible. But we want that syntax. We want the Node module syntax now because those import and export and the static analysis that comes with them and the readability and the live bindings, all of that is really cool, right? So still, even if we have native support for most of what we need, what about all the browsers? You know, what about IE? What about Firefox and Chrome or just Node 4, which is still an extremely well-used LTS version? And that's just ES2015. What about ES2016, however small it might be? What about ES2017 coming up in a couple of months? Uh, what do we do about those? So obviously Babel, right? Who here uses Babel? Of course you do. Babel is amazing. I want to hack Sebastian McKenzie like crazy. Uh, Maybe, though, do not Babel all the things, right? Uh, since Babel 6, over a year ago, uh, we could start cherry-picking, and that was a world of grief for people not used to it, uh, cherry-picking every syntax that we actually want to understand and whether we want to transpile that syntax or leave it native. And that's great. Uh, and the bigger the native support gets, and the smaller our transpiled share needs to be. Uh, there's a performance question there. Uh, we'll talk about it. But uh, what that means, if we transpile less, is that we can build faster, especially in the watch cycle. Uh, and we can run faster as the native performance catches up with the transpiled uh, performance code. There's actually a myth that the transpiled code is inherently slower than if it were native, and that's actually not how it works right now. Babel does an incredible job at producing super efficient ES5 code in terms of performance, uh, to the point that, uh, for instance, V8 just released five, version 5.6. It's super confusing, right, because the, the name of the product is a version number, but it's not its own version number. You know? So it's V8, V5.6. And, um, and um, they actually made a point in the release notes of telling you that 
a lot of ES 2015 syntaxes, mostly the structuring and rest and spread and a couple others, are now natively as performant as the transpiled Babel code. So it's actually native playing catch up, which seems like a counter argument to what I'm saying, because it feels like if transpiled code is so much more efficient, why don't we transpile all the things? Simply because it is so much more efficient now. Uh, the native version is always going to win in the medium term or in the long term. Uh, also, what kind of performance are we talking about? Uh, when you are doing mostly like a user interaction code, if it's not in a fat request and fr animation frame kind of WebGL loop, and most of us are not, most of us are doing apps with like forms and drag and drops and stuff like that, uh, we do not need 16 million FPS, right? We don't even need 60. Uh, we need less, and uh, most of those benchmarks are telling you that, oh, that code is going to run 90 million times a second instead of 60 million times. And I'll tell you, 60 million is okay. It's fine. We don't really need to go faster than that. Um, and the, the other side, obviously, is the server side, because the server side, well, the, the speed directly impacts the uh, chart, you know, their scaling capacity. So uh, we might be concerned about overusing that uh, on the server side. But even so, it's the, the native performance is super fast already. It's just going to get faster and faster. Mostly we're thinking about promises, generators, async await, this kind of thing. Uh, you should still rely on native when it's possible. Uh, that's your best way forward. Um, so Babel has plugins uh, which are mostly syntaxes and transforms. So syntax, as you well know, I'm not going to explain Babel because this is a knowledgeable crowd. Right? But um, the syntax plugins basically understand the new syntaxes in the code, and the transform plugins will actually transpile that syntax instead of leaving it alone. Um, there are tons, actually. These are links. You're going to, to get a link to the slides at the end of this talk. Um, Babel currently has 60 plus official transforms, 21 of which are basically ES 2015 or 2016 or 2017. Uh, and there are so many more. So you don't want to provide all these plugins all the time. So you have presets. Presets are just pre-bundled plugin sets. There are six official presets, ES 2015, ES 2016, which only Im embeds the extra stuff, ES 2017, which again only embeds what we know will be in ES 2017 for sure, in addition of ES 2016. There's one great one called Latest, which you should use. Latest basically is everything up to the next one which we know about. So that would be everything guaranteed to be in ES 2015, 16, or 17. So everything that is currently at stage four in ES 2017. Uh, there's a React one because, well, React. And uh, there's, I'm not going to troll on Gulotu today, but it's very hard. Um, and uh, those who know me know. And um, there's a new one, which we're going to talk about. I actually realized it was there uh, prepping this talk, because it, it got released like 10 days ago, um, which is really cool. It's called ENV. And there are four experimental ones. For those of you like me, who are sort of like hotheads and want to play now with stuff that is not going to make it for sure yet in the next version, so stuff at stage three, stage two, I actually play with stage zero stuff, because I'm that kind of reckless hothead. And there are over 750 community-based presets for just about anything. Uh, and that's much more than ES 2016 or ES 2017. You know, uh, you have stages, as I said. For example, there's transform for rest and spread properties, which are currently stage three. I hope they make it in ES 2017. Class and property decorators, one of my favorite things. Um, function bind syntax, which is really fun. Really cool. And many others, there's stuff like JSX, obviously, flow annotations, uh, module conversion, which is a, uh, something we need right now, minification optimization, plenty of stuff. So how do I tell, damn it, it overflows. How do I tell Babel um, what uh, we need? Usually you use a .babel LC file, right, which is a JSON file. Uh, I tend to run all my stuff through NPM scripts. And I don't like having a gazillion configuration file, so most of the time I actually shove that my, my Babel configuration in my package.json, but your mileage may vary. What it looks like is a preset settings, possibly an extra plugin settings for extra stuff you want to cherry pick. And that looks like this. Do you see that env thing right there? That should remind you of auto prefixer. I'm going to talk about it. It's really cool for the front end guys. 
And show me the specs. OK, so browser side. Um, if you have to support IE, who here still has to support IE, even 9 plus? Yeah, yeah, I feel your pain. I know. I, I, I run my own business, so I'm the, the hippo. And I, I, I said basically, go die to IE. So it's, it's just age 14 for me. So my life is a rainbow, but uh, I, I feel your pain. The, uh, so yeah, if you have IE9+, plus, basically, you have to transpile everything. So this whole talk is sort of moot, uh, because IE9 has 100% ES5, which is great, except the strict mode, but that's OK. Uh, but it has no ES2015. IE11, quaintly enough, has 11%. Uh, of, uh, but Edge 14 <laughs> does not have 14%, right? It has way better. Um, so you could use either the official preset, ES2015, or you could use latest. I would advise you to use latest because that basically anything currently guaranteed to be in the language, either already or in the next version. And that sort of like works across the board. And by default, that's going to transpile everything. And that's OK. Honestly, the performance is great. Um, if you only have to worry about evergreens, which is great, uh, like the la you could manually pick the last two versions and then trim to 1% usage. So that kicks out i6, 7, and 8, usually, um, uh, automatically. Uh, you could like crisscross that with a Kangax's uh, compatibility table, cross-ref everything. That's a pain. Uh, I used to have slides for that, but 10 days ago, this kind of pain got alleviated by the official env plugin. Um, so that's a preset, sorry, not a plugin. And you can define targets for it. And it crosses all that for you. It goes with the compatibility table and with browser lists and all that, much like auto prefixer does on the CSS side. And it lets you define specific targets in terms of browsers or node. And I could say here, for instance, well, Traditional kind of setting for all browsers. I want at least 1% usage uh, worldwide. You, you could target that to specific countries. Or at least end the last two versions, uh, except for Safari, because uh, I really don't want to bother with Safari 9 because it's so bad. Uh, so Safari 10 and above uh, would be fine. And the debug setting will output in console log the full list of plugins that it computed for you so that it can verify that it matches your expectations. And it does that automatically, and it's auto-maintained. Uh, you have to just um, update the setting, because uh, it builds itself its own set of plugins based on that. But it's great. So you finally have that kind of, it's not feature detection, because obviously you do not know which browsers you're going to run on uh, specifically, but it makes sure you transpile just as much as your target audience needs. Uh, on the Node side, we have had a preset, a preset for a while, a pretty great, called latest-minimal. What it does is it feature detects. It feature detects at Bootstrap. It, it's like a couple milliseconds. It's super, super fast. And it, it just feature detects your native support on your Node um, implementation, your current Node version. And it just defines the minimal set of plugins you need to have uh, all of the latest ES 20, 16, 17 goodies you need and leave as native everything that can be. Uh, you could do that with env as well. If you want to have just like one setting, uh, you could use a single env setting with targets with browsers, like I had, and a node target, which you, you would use at true or current, which is the same thing. Uh, so if you don't want to have multiple presets for your front end and your back end, you could uh, just use uh, env for both of these. That's, that's kind of pretty cool. And. I just want to talk quickly about TypeScript. You are very polite. Because, uh, well, if you're in Angular 2, people, you go with TypeScript 2, obviously. But if you're not Angular 2, usually you go, what, TypeScript? Hey, hey, Microsoft is nice these days, OK? Um, Microsoft is cool. Plenty of great people there. So just uh, who here knows or has played with TypeScript? TypeScript 2? Uh, you gotta, you, you got to switch. you really got to switch if you do TypeScript. So TypeScript really as an approximation, thank you for the light, um, is um, ES 2016 plus optional type annotation plus JSX compatibility because, again, React. Um, and TS2 by default transpiles to ES5, but you could actually ask it to transpile to ES 2015 now. Uh, it's built in uh, Visual Studio 2013, update 2 and above, and it's built in Visual Studio Code which, incidentally, is written in Node, right? It's an Electron app. 
Um, there is not much type inference going on. Uh, it mostly relies on annotation. That's sort of what you get with IntelliSense. IntelliSense is very much relies on pre-baked type definitions, and it does some type inference to help you along. There's an enormous, really high quality repository of type definition files for just about any library or node module you want to use are definitely typed. Uh, it, it can be automatically imported now for you. There are tools that will auto-detect what you use and auto-import the type devs for you. So it's kind of neat. Uh, the official documentation lists a large set of integrations with TypeScript with just about anything, Browserify, Webpack, Grunt, Gulp, JSPM, Rollup. There's a guy actually going to talk to you. Um, so it works pretty well. It really depends whether you need it or not. I'm not the client for TypeScript. I'm not, I'm not the target audience. I do not really feel the need for type annotations, even in, on large code bases. But there are a number of use cases where I can see the value of type annotations, be it TypeScript or something else. Uh, if you have teams that move a lot, a lot of people onboarding and departing, or like a very, very large code base, and uh, you want to run some static analysis on it, uh, that's something even if you are really, like me, reluctant to add proprietary stuff to your otherwise standard uh, ES code, um, have a look at it. Uh, personally, I'm more of a fan of Flow. Uh, flow is another way of doing a statically typed, uh, or at least more statically typed, um, a code all over on top of uh, ECMAScript. Um, it is from Facebook. It is quite excellent. It's written in OCaml, so extra points. Um, and I have heard a lot that the, the kind of feedback messages from the type checker that you get from Flow is usually a bit more friendly and usable, like shownable, than what you get in TypeScript too. But honestly, I haven't really played with those enough to have my personal opinion. Uh, what I'm saying is that you should check it out. Uh, you should check out how it goes. Um, there's a great integration with your IDs to have light feedback and everything. Uh, and if you're interested in statically typing um, your code to some extent, because Flow is, is a lot based on type inference, it's a very gradual system, much more so than TS, uh, you should look at it. Uh, you, you can just like do it bit by bit, and um, it should work fine. And I can't believe I'm exactly on time. Thank you. <laughs>